What orientation do you have? It says grad. This one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. My goal is the same for that regard, so I'm getting all really good. Okay. okay. about riparian buffers, a chance to facilitate bat populations rebounding from white nose syndrome on a national scale. So for those of you who aren't familiar, white nose syndrome is a fungus-based disease that came over from Europe uh, around 2006, it first showed up in New York. And it's a fungus that appears on the bats and wakes them up during hibernation uh, and causes them to fly out into the winter and die of dehydration, starvation, and stuff like that, as well as also deteriorating their skin and making it more difficult for them to hunt and perform. Um, and it spreads extremely uh, prolifically, and it's been wiping out bat colonies in just massive numbers. Uh, the disease has spread all over the place since it first arrived in New York, which is what we see in this chart from whitenosesyndrome.org in the bottom left there. It's reached as far as Oklahoma and Nebraska going west, and just very recently, one case showed up in Washington all the way on the West Coast, which is a concerning suggestion that this is probably something that's going to end up impacting the entire nation. In terms of the scale with which this is affecting bats, this is a, a, a sample of the statistics in bat population changes um, from a study that I was looking at. And what you're looking at here is an indication showing that uh, in, in New York, um, bat populations for these three species have declined by 91%, 72%, and 97%, uh, respectively, for three different species of bats. In Pennsylvania, um, we're looking at increases of 99%, of 100% of, of even, in the, in the study areas uh, where, where they're looking for uh, changes in bat populations. So in terms of what bats mean to us, you know, to, to the world, we can say that they're, they're intrinsically valuable. We, can, we should be concerned about uh, these, these species going missing. We should be helping them just because they're dying. But in terms of uh, what, these, what these species mean in an ecological concept, um, first of all, they're pretty much the biggest insect control predator that we have. And this makes a bunch of differences. Um, their effect on crop protection was estimated uh, in, a, in one study in, from 1997 to be worth about a trillion dollars a year in, um, in pest control. And the increased service in natural pest control also decreases the need for things like pesticides um, and other control agents, and that can increase the viability of organic farming and protect the quality of river health. And then in terms of uh, wild plant communities, it's worth understanding that insects are most likely to prey on native plants, so that when there's a boom in insect population, it's the native plants that suffer the most. So the uh, problems with exotic invasives that we're experiencing also have the potential to be exacerbated by the uh, tremendous missing in the <clears throat> insect control effect that bats normally provide. Then the other thing is that booming insect populations also just produce a lot more diseases, so that can be from um, mosquitoes, that can be from ticks, that can be from all, all kinds of things. So in terms of why buffers make a good mark for implementing this kind of uh, habitat restoration on a national scale, um, first of all, habitat has a big potential to make a difference for, for bats suffering from the disease. When, they ha when they're well fed and well sheltered, they have a much better time resisting and recovering from the disease, and it also means that bats will have more of an opportunity to reproduce, which they really need, uh, because they reproduce very slowly. They only produce about one pup a year, um, so they need good stable conditions for reproduction. Um, riparian buffers are great for bats. They're right up against rivers where a lot of the insects that they feed on uh, reproduce and live. And, and they use these uh, corridors to get from one place to another. So um, the more riparian buffer habitat there is, the less habitat fragmentation, that is habitats being split up, uh, has to be an issue. And then the great thing about buffers is that their 
they're just enormously implemented as it is. Like this is something that's already being used as a framework on a national scale, this idea of planting trees uh, along, along riversides. In the Chesapeake Bay area uh, alone, uh, since 1996, one network of uh, water restoration workers have restored 8,000 miles of riparian buffer. And that's, that's just in, in one area, in kind of like the Washington, Virginia region. And this is something that can be taken advantage of all over the country. So the way that we can use these riparian buffers is by uh, implementing more shaggy bark trees. And this can be really pretty much any tree with shaggy bark, because what bats do is that they, they use these to roost. They use these to take shelter. And it gives them uh, a place to live, a place to hunt, uh, and a place to socialize. In terms of what trees are currently being used, uh, if we refer to one study that was done in Maryland, we can get an example of, of what the breakdown looks like. And of the most common trees that they found in their survey, only two of them were shaggy barked. So these, these are trees that are used um, to some extent as it is, but what we have is the potential to uh, scale up these trees significantly. And an interesting thing that's worth noting is that whenever riparian restoration is done, um, only a certain amount of the trees that emerge um, are going to be from the artificial plantings. There's, there's always going to be seeds in the bank. So there's, so there's always going to be um, some natural uh, regeneration this study found about one third. That's just from what's there. And this is encouraging because it means that we have the potential to really infuse areas with shaggy bark trees without disrupting uh, the natural composition too much. And then the other thing about uh, shaggy bark trees is that there are plenty of kinds of them. Bats aren't too picky about which ones we need to use. Um, I'm bringing up this, this image here to, to talk about the, the three zone concept that's sometimes used in riparian buffers. Um, which is you have your trees that are right up against the river, which are going to be like your, your, your floodplain tolerant trees who always like their feet wet and like a lot of disturbance. You're going to have uh, in zone two trees that like, like things a little bit drier, a little bit less disturbed, a little bit more established. And then they usually think in terms of there being a grass field and then a farmland. This is how a lot of riparian buffers plan their design. And the point I'd like to make here uh, with this chart in the, in the bottom right um, is that these, these are all shaggy bark trees down here, and uh, these are these are different qualities that they have, like what kind of moisture they prefer, what kind of sun they prefer, um, and what regions they, they live in. And the point I want to make is that in, in every zone of, of these restoration areas, um, there are multiple trees that can fit the job and do well in that habitat. And it's also worth noting that uh, a lot of these trees have native ranges that are very uh, coincident and, and then some with where the, where the disease um, is hitting. So um, I'm showing silver maple in this case. You can see that it's, it's native to pretty much everywhere um, where, where the disease is currently, except for that one appearance in Washington, so that we have a lot of potential to use natural um, native tree communities in order to uh, establish these uh, designs we would just be increasing the presence of these shaggy bark trees and stands. Um, there are bats on the west coast that are probably going to need help too, and they're going to be different species, uh, but there are shaggy bark trees over there too, like these this roost. And then it's worth noting that these, these trees wouldn't by any means just be providing benefit for bats. Um, these are all trees that have uh, diverse applications in their ecosystem benefits. So we've got American elm, which provides food for all, all these kinds of different birds. Um, white pine provides food for uh, deer and small mammals. Uh, green ash is uh, a noted shelter species for uh, small ground dwellers. Silver maples are a really good uh, provider of woody debris for streams, which uh, helps uh, bring up flow, create estuaries, create habitat for fish, things like that. So these are all trees that can be very involved in the ecosystem, and, and we wouldn't be losing the ecosystem value by playing up uh, the bat habitat. So in terms of how easy this is for uh, riparian buffer designers to implement, it raises the question of 
would it, would it be expensive? Would there be a cost to playing up these shiny bark trees? And what you're looking at here is, is an analysis I did um, pulling together data from every nursery I could find that gave uh, prices on its trees. And long story short, what the analysis shows is that there isn't a difference, a meaningful difference, um, based on whether, whether the trees are shaggy or not. They cost about the same. Um, some options like white pine are, are actually uh, consistently very cheap. Um, and none of them are, are outstandingly expensive. So the point I'm wanting to make here is that this isn't something that would take a big argument about budgeting, and if it's worth it, they could be using the same financial resources that they're using right now with a different selection in trees in order to make this difference for bad habitat. So bad habitat uh, restoration on a national scale would have the power to substantially increase their ability to resist and rebound from the disease. And riparian buffers have a massive potential to be put to use for this. It would not be hard. Uh, it, it would not detrimentally impact the ecosystem services. It would not detriment, detrimentally impact the economic viability. They would only need to adjust the species of trees that they're emphasizing in their plan. I believe that this plan could be effectively implemented, and I would like to see discussion about it and see it begin to be implemented by riparian buffer designers as soon as possible. And thank you. Ready to take questions? Uh, yeah. um, I didn't know that they used trees. Do you know the percentage of like um, ones that use caves versus trees, or do they use both? They'll use both. They really like caves for hibernating in the winter. Uh, trees are really popular in, in the warm season, and they'll, they'll use them if, uh, if they need to if there are no caves around. I know that all the bats that we have around here, that you'll think about like little brown bats, big brown bats, a um, little bit more out west in Indiana bats, they'll, they'll all make use of trees. They make use of them quite a bit, um, and they're usually close to where they hunt and stuff like that. I was going to ask, uh, what's the survival rate for a bat that's like this in the Low, very low. Um, <laughs> It, it doesn't it doesn't look good for them. What we see is that it's very, very common for areas hit with white nose syndrome, uh, like individual roosts uh, referred to as hibernacula, like cave where they're around where there's colonies. We'll see like 90% drops or higher in, in how many bats were there. And we've seen about like like in terms of all of New England, like an 80% decline in bat population is massive. That is crazy. Um, does it directly correlate with uh, or Riparian zones is one of the factors of, of just habitat presence. So the, so the way that it correlates is if, if there aren't good riparian zones around, there's not good bat habitat around, so they, they, they can't feed, they're having a hard time um, recovering from the disease because they don't have energy, they're having, they're having a hard time surviving well in the summer. When a bat has the disease, their, their best shot of making it through the winter is by feeding so successfully in the summer that they can put up with the disturbance of So basically, we know that riparian buffers are used heavily by bats for hunting and, and living. Um, and so therefore, it seems like a great idea to produce just massive amounts of bat habitat for riparian buffers um, and support their recovery from the disease that way. That's what you think. First of all, I really appreciate your, you framing the issue as far as how much it would cost to eat, to, to kill the bugs that the bats kill. I think it's a really strong framework sure. for environmental arguments. So here's my question. If you were given $10 million, you'd allocate it to rebuilding uh, habitat in riparian zones as opposed to looking for a cure for white and syndrome. This is uh, something that can be done alongside the cure for white nose syndrome, and I'm glad you brought that up because there is some progress that's being made uh, with that. Yeah, that's what I've heard, so I was curious, like, why not just double down on fixing? Like, is, is there already enough? Because, uh, one, it needs more time to be, like, really implemented. Like, they've just found out a bacteria that has a shot at getting off the disease. They're still figuring out how to really spread it to the bats. And two, their populations are a wreck right now. They need help rebounding, even if the disease were to just disappear. 
like that. So both because the disease is going to be continuing to spread and continuing to do damage while we're figuring out how to implement the cure, and because even when we do uh, implement the cure, they're going to need help recovering uh, so that <coughs> cure is, is successful. Um, there's, there's just a bunch of reasons why it's really going to make it much more likely that they're going to be able to successfully rebound uh, to the kind of numbers um, that we miss having them at if they can have as much habitat as possible. And that's why it's so promising that there's such an opportunity for large-scale habitat restoration using existing infrastructure. Other comments or questions? Yeah. Sorry. Is the spread of the disease um, due to bats like roosting in different caves, or is it more from humans spreading it? There's certainly a concern about humans spreading it, and uh, informational websites like whitenosesyndrome.org that try to inform people talk a lot about people staying out of caves, about uh, decontaminating themselves if they're visiting. So it's something that, that people are very concerned about. Um, that said, bats are very social, they roost very close together, and they've also just been spreading a lot themselves. Uh, we've seen some bats even trying to roost more solitarily in response to this, so like the bats themselves are, are um, it's a hard thing to monitor. Like, bats are kind of a slippery species, um, and we don't know everything about how it spreads by a long shot. Um, but basically the fungus, you know, fungal spores, they'll get around kind of any way they can. Um, so if, if pretty much any question about, is there a concern with white nose spreading in X way, Any other questions? Uh, I'll have one more. What, uh, I think that this is really impressive what you put together and your arguments are really strong. What's next? What are you gonna do with this next? What I'd like to do is I'd like to get involved with the kind of groups that are actually planning these riparian buffers and say, hey, look at this. Um, are you interested in bats? If not, here's why you should be. And then here's something that we could do together that with you guys, like seamlessly continuing to doing what you're uh, what you're doing now, and continuing to do this in a, in a way that wouldn't cost you anything new, we could include a specialization for bat habitats that would seriously improve the ability of these really important species to rebound. So I wanna I wanna see this go big. Like I actually would love to start talking with um, organizations that are doing this kind of restoration work and say, here, I I did this research. I I can show you that. Idea and it should be pretty easy to implement. Why don't we start thinking about doing this? Good job. Thanks. Awesome.